Awesome. All right, so we're here. Um, I'm G, as you guys know, everyone on my YouTube channel, and this is Jackson or Historic Running. Why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, I'm Jackson. I am the curator of Historic Running. You can uh, follow me on Instagram and Facebook, Historic Running. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. You know, this is the first time we're talking face to face, although we've been friends for like, I don't know, two and a half, three years now, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty funny meeting people on the internet and then you become friends, pretty close friends, and then you only get to meet them every so once in a while. This is our first face to face on, you know, like the internet. Yeah, I know, especially because of COVID. I mean, you said you <laughs> wanted to come to New York and I went to the West Coast last year, so I was hoping, you know, it would <laughs> it would happen, but now we can't. But soon, soon, definitely. Yeah, hopefully soon. And especially, you know, we'll tell everyone, you know, the main event that they want to hear about the moon shoes. Now you should have some money to hopefully come to New York. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely fly out as soon as the money comes in and COVID <laughs> ch chills down a little bit. Yeah, what's it called? So I feel like it would be good if we give a little teaser in the beginning. You could talk about the sale and then we'll go into how you started historic running. And then from there, everything about the shoes and the full story, if you want to do that. Yeah, sure, that works. So pretty much I went with uh, Sotheby's Auction House, uh, had it up there for about six months. Uh, you know, I had it at 200000 originally, no bites, went down to one fifty, no bites, and then uh, dropped it down to 100000 eventually a couple weeks ago. And then they just started to have this uh, auction uh, house uh, sale option and Hong Kong. So, uh, you know, I, my uh, auction guy asked me if I wanted to go there, do that route. I said, just whatever you think is going to do the best for my shoes. And uh, so they got there, the uh, auction auctioneer guy, I guess his name is uh, Adrian Chang. He's also the same person that had bought my shoes and they sold the first day they got there, which was pretty awesome. <laughs> oh, wow. You know what's crazy is everything you've been showing me with the curation for, I think it was like the rarest Nikes ever along the timeline that they yeah. had. They gave it so much advertising. It was huge, like <laughs> the billboards and everything. And then here you get nothing. You get an Instagram post. From yeah, the 70s. It, it was crazy. Like I was, when I, when they first had posted my shoes, I was like, there was almost no attention towards them. I couldn't even find them on the internet when I searched moon shoes. And then when they go to Hong Kong and they got all this love and appreciation. So it's pretty dope to see. Yeah. And they sold the first day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was like, wow, man, well, that would have, that kind of sucks. I dropped the price down a little bit, but I'm happy, you know, they're sold. And yeah. I'm happy, happy they got the attention that they so deserved. Yeah. So one more question about the moon shoes before we get to hear the story about you, because sure. I want to hear a lot and I have a lot of questions for you, <laughs> but, um, what makes this different from the moon shoes that the shoeseum had? Didn't those sell for like almost 500,000? Yeah, yeah. So pretty much uh, his pair sold for 437,000, I believe. Um, those were an unworn pair, but uh, technically all of them had been worn because they were specially tailored to each athlete. So they had at least tried them on, maybe wore them for strides. Um, so pretty much when Jordan Geller sold his pair of the shoes, uh, with Sotheby's in 2019, that was pretty much the first pair to hit a large auction. So I believe all the hype from his other pairs he was selling really transitioned into his moon shoes and that collector really wanted them. Wow. Yeah. I was just wondering that because it was odd because honestly, I really like your pair one yeah. because of the wear. But then two, they had that very nice blue midsole. And I'll try to get a picture to show whoever's watching this uh, mm -hmm. video podcast what they look like. But um, yeah, they're a great pair. And now before we talk about everything, the whole story and the background, how you got them, what made you start Historic Running? Or when did uh, you start it too, exactly? Yeah, yeah. So I guess if we go back a little bit before Historic Running, uh, when I started got getting interested into like vintage wear and vintage track and field and stuff. Uh, when I tried out for the seventh grade track team, uh, my dad had mentioned that he had a pair of track spikes called the Nike universe. I don't have them with me. I, he actually had, I bought him a pair cause he, uh, his pair got thrown away a long time ago. I bought him a pair just to have, 
but uh, they're pretty much an orange uh, Nike track spike with six pins on the bottom and a waffle tread. And there, I thought they were the coolest thing ever. So from there, uh, I kind of researched, you know, different vintage stuff over the next four years, you know, like during high school and such. And that's where Jordan Geller kind of comes in. I, he would post videos regularly about vintage track spikes, like the pre-Montreals, the Nike Americas, Nova's, a uh, bunch of other stuff. So that's where, you know, part of my background of learning stuff came in. And then right after high school had ended, uh, the, next, the next year, 2017, like around a little bit after summer, I started Historic Running on Instagram. I was just, uh, you know, part of the inspiration was, you know, I really like the show American Pickers. I just like sharing that information that's not very known or, you know, is kind of getting lost. And I, I just feel like people and things should be more appreciated for what they are and, you know, the history and what it brings forth in the future, you know? So that's yeah. kind of where, kind of where it started. Yeah. Wait, here, I'll break it right here because this is something that I know I tell you all the time and you know it, but everyone else doesn't. I think you should post so much more because <laughs> what you post is amazing. And honestly, yeah. it's what I love about vintage sneakers and even Supreme now for me is that mm -hmm. it's a whole, you know, timeline and history that you can learn from, appreciate. Yeah. And really there's so much to do with it. And especially track because it's such a niche sport. And then when you are a collector of spikes in vintage track, <laughs> it's maybe like, I don't know, 10,000 people in the world. So um, yeah, it's just, it's a great story. And people don't know that Nike is a running brand. Like it yeah. started from the waffle shoes, the moon shoes that you had. So without the ones that you just sold, there wouldn't be Nike, Jordan, all of that. It may be, but not to the extent that we have it currently. Right. And yeah, I think maybe we could tease for the people, but sometime in New York, we're going to have to have a pop-up or gallery or something because <laughs> you have a crazy collection. And I know we both just like collecting random things. So I yeah. feel like aside from track, you know, there would be a lot for everyone because we, we cover a lot of bases from vintage vinyl to um, track spikes, Supreme, everything. So it would yeah. definitely be good. Yeah, I, I definitely, I know we kind of talked about that just kind of joking around, but I, I'm definitely down for that whenever the time is. That would be awesome to have a pop-up. Yeah, no, it'd definitely be cool. And then, um, wait, before, before you get going on, you know, how the ball started rolling for historic running, mm -hmm. just really quickly, I can't stop looking at those Adidas in the back. What are those? Okay, so these are Adidas organs, and you can see they're signed by Bill Dellinger. So wow. in the early to mid-80s, Bill Dellinger kind of had this uh, sponsorship with adidas so not really sponsorship but he was working with adidas and uh he had his own technology called the web series for just the absorption of you know the hard uh ground onto your feet so pretty much it compresses out of the the webbing technology and then it goes back in or whatever so this is an original pair um then it has a signature uh he signed this uh in the early 2000s i got this from a former oregon athlete do you have both shoes or just a single? It's just a single. I wish it was both pairs, but it'll do. Yeah, no, both pairs is definitely cool. But then at the same time, it's also nice to appreciate a single shoe that you have because who knows who has the other one? And it's like a bond yeah. that you have with someone <laughs> that you don't even know about. <laughs> yeah, that would but, be awesome. But that's a question I've always had because – so the moon shoe is late 70s, right? No, early 70s. So – uh my pretty much all the moon moon shoes i'm sorry moon shoes are from 1972 there was a few that may have branched in the early 1973 but not many so then how did it work what's the timeline here so moon shoe 72 then there's a gap that like no one speaks about and then <laughs> oregon's nike because not a lot of people know that oregon was an adidas school or not school but at least all the runners wore adidas even though they had moon shoes, right? Yeah, yeah. So, like, if you go back before Nike, um, especially with, like, track and field and such, the really the main brands were Adidas and Puma. And then you had your other brands that were kind of like your main sportswear brands, kind of like uh, 
like Champion and, you know, Russell and stuff, they kind of, some of, some of those uh, brands that were more garment related had their own kind of track spike arena, but pretty much your, your athletes would be wearing Adidas, you know, Steve Prefontaine mostly wore Adidas spikes. Um, so when you go look at that, um, let's see, uh, really when the prototypes of Nike started happening, which really, really started happening around 1971 into 1972, it really didn't become a, you know, a staple in people's, uh, rotations till around 73, 74, I would say. Wow. So that's, that's pretty cool because you know, Prefontaine is a face of Nike yet he wore Adidas yeah. and they had, and it's not even like, it's not even like they didn't have Nikes at that point. Like he could have worn the moon shoes. Do you know if he ever wore a pair? Because I know so, all the pictures are him wearing Adidas. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, he actually does, he actually did have a pair of moon shoes. I know the guy that has his specific pair, he got it from Pat Tyson, which was Steve Prefontaine's roommate. Um, the story that he had told me was that Steve Prefontaine did not like the shoe, so he didn't wear them. He gave them to his, his roommate. So he, it sounds like he was pretty picky and he liked his Adidas spikes and his trainers and such. And I guess he really, he really didn't start wearing Nike till like late 74, I believe. So he only wore Nike about, you know, a year, year and a half before he died. Wow. So it was Man. a very short period of his, you know, athletic career. And so he wore... I know he wore those, like, it was either blue leather or blue suede Adidas, and mm -hmm. then they had the, his shoes that then became the pre-Montreals, right? Yeah, yeah, so, um, back then, it was mostly, like, either, like, a kangaroo leather or, like, a, like, a suede track spike and trainers, um, and then around late 73, early 74, he got his own track spike, which was called the pre-Montreal, which they then, then retroed in, like, 2010 as like a trainer version but there's three different variations of his uh track spike that he had throughout that like two years uh stretch his original one if i don't know if you've heard it uh he didn't like that uh he liked the one piece toe he didn't like uh that reinforcement oh, the that split? Was the yeah yeah, yeah, that's yeah. How, that was the original pre-montreal what had a split in the middle and he didn't yeah. like that so the next two models uh, had a one piece toe and then they just kind of modified the track spike plate later in the years. And then that, that, uh, pre Montreal spike, uh, went a year into production after his death. So it went to 1976 was the last year that they made those. And then, so what I think is pretty cool is I think the pre Montreal's that split definitely had to inspire the Jassaris, which are the, yeah. um, the king of the modern spike right yeah that's 90 93 i think or 94 or something like that uh i so like early prototypes i think were like 95 but production was like 96 definitely i think one of the most innovative nike spikes that they've made maybe spikes in general honestly such a good yeah. spike. yeah so what's it called um i feel like this is a good segue because you know we're moving to speaking about spikes and how they're all controversial now but maybe mm -hmm. let's let's break it here because we went on a bit of a tangent and now <laughs> how did before we get back into like the Jasari into now because I feel like that's a good a good segue you know you go Jasari then OG Vic and mm -hmm. then and then the super shoes which both of us had in 2016 and now people are all saying how they're cheating but yeah we'll talk about that later but so how'd you get the moon shoes just so we could go oh. back so, we so, so pretty much, uh, timeline wise, I had bought them in 2018, October ish of 2018. So I was 19 at the time, I believe. And I had purchased them through somebody that was selling for the family. Um, with the family obviously being the McChesney family. Um, so they had had it in their, you know, their, their family since 1972 to 2018. And the, uh, they, the, the family members, the the parents, the McChesney parents were getting older. They had to go into, you know, a home just because they couldn't do their daily lives normally. And so they were letting go a lot of their track and field memorabilia and such like that. And uh, I ended up purchasing them for $10,000, which at the time was 
top retail for him. It, it kind of seemed crazy because that was all my money at the time. And so you got that. I don't want to like reveal too much information about where they live or anything, but that yeah, was yeah. in Oregon, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, if we just venture into the McChesney family, they moved to Oregon in, I believe, the 50s, mid-50s. Uh, they were very detrimental to the Oregon Track Club. So they, they helped form the Oregon Track Club Masters program. So oh, wow. the, the two parents are uh, Bill McChesney Sr. and then Marcia McChesney. They both had just passed away in 2020, sadly. But oh, wow. uh, they had four children. All were track athletes. Uh, so you had the owner of My Moon Shoes, which was Bill, or no, I'm sorry, not Bill, Tom McChesney. Then you had Steve McChesney, uh, Tom, or Bill McChesney Jr. And then you had Ken McChesney. All track and field athletes. The first three all ran at Oregon and were all American runners. Uh, so it's a crazy good family. Yeah, yeah. It's like when you think of, Oregon and running you think of the McChesney family and you know as wow. I, I had bought those shoes just to collect but as more information came and I was learning more about these shoes and the family it was it, it was really like a plan for me to you know share the history of their family because it's not known as much anymore like they are the OG family of Oregon and they should be known yeah no that's great and honestly I think it's a great thing what you did because you're a collector and yes, it is amazing to have one of the first Nikes, but at the same time, you need to have, you know, the money to continue this because yeah. it's, it's not like we get a stipend from the government for collecting. <laughs> so um, yeah, no, I, I think it's great. And what you also have to realize is Nike is known all over the world and Japan has a huge running scene, but I don't know if, you know, China and or Hong Kong has a big distance running scene because you don't hear about it much. So hopefully these moon shoes bring track into into china hong kong and just you know asia in general yeah that would be awesome you know you think of running in asia you only think of japan so if we can get track and field spread out anywhere in the world especially you know where my moon shoes landed that would be awesome yeah so now it's only right let's now talk about the modern spikes because <laughs> the moon shoes paved the way so right now what we have is moon shoe then there were the Adidas with pre, pre Montreal, mm -hmm. and then is there anything between pre Montreal and Jasari, or you think we can just go right to Jasari because it's the king of the modern spikes? Yeah, so pretty much there was a lot of innovation for the time in the '70s with Nike. Um, so uh, after the Moon Shoe, their next big thing was the Oregon Waffle, which was pretty much just a revamped moon shoe, like more modern, uh, just a lot more tech towards it. Then you have no the spikes, uh, right? Yeah. Uh, no, they're uh, like a, a flat. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so it's still at the waffle bottom. There's, it's pretty much just a slim down moon shoe for racing. Then uh, you got the Oregon train or I'm sorry, the waffle trainer. Then you had a couple other waffle shoes, eighties, you know, there was a lot of the air technology. Um, you know, there were some good trainers, but, you know, not as they weren't, you know, as, as the 80s came in, they just started transitioning into other sports. So I feel like their running development kind of halted a little bit. Not too yeah. much, but just a little bit. And then. And, and there was, sorry to cut you off. And there was also the road running. So I feel like. Yeah. At yeah. least in the 80s, road running was, had triumph track for a little bit. And then we got the Air Max. Air Max ones, you know, yeah. people running marathons and Air Maxes. That's funny to us now, but <laughs> I wear them. I wear them every day, and I'm always like, if people used to run in these, why don't I just run in them? They're my favorite shoes. <laughs> That'd be funny. You should run a marathon in those. NYC Can you imagine? Marathon. Yeah, <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> Get Nike to sponsor me. Let me Nike. Let me customize a pair of Air Max ones, and I'll run the marathon in them. <laughs> yeah, you should get some Zoom X in there too. That'd be awesome. That would be amazing. But, um, all right, so now, um, we're in the 90s because 80s track innovation, as you said, probably was not up to where it should have been, and it's mm -hmm. fine, you know, Nike had to branch out, they also had Jordan, so yeah, you, you have to go that right way when you have it. But, um, okay, so we're at the Jasari's, mm -hmm. and they're just amazing. Do you have a pair still or not? Uh, 
Uh, I have a pair that I took apart that I was going to swap, yeah. but I don't have a full pair anymore. Yeah, I wish I had mine. I don't have any of my <laughs> stuff with me, but um, yeah, I still have a pair of Jasari's, but um, yeah, so then, all right, so help, help me because I'm not good at late 90s to early 2000s. I just know, you know, all of the OG Vicks and everything. So what's between yeah. Jasari and OG Vic? So between the Jasari and the, the OG Vic, there was, I believe it's called Eldorate. Um, I'm not sure. Oh, if yeah, I the Eldorate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Elder. It's, yeah, yeah. So that was, you know, one of the cities in uh, Kenya named after. That That was another OG. That was like 97, 98. Then you had the Zoom Kennedys, early 2000s. Uh, let's see. And those were Bob Kennedys, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Bob Kennedy. So he's pretty much the first uh, American track athlete to have his own Nike spike pretty much since after Prefontaine. From my yeah, knowledge, and we and we don't have any. That would be great. Now, can you imagine? <laughs> yeah, this is huge. This would be huge for Nike. They have the most controversial shoes ever, which I'm a fan of. And <laughs> track track slowly coming up there. So I don't know. Maybe they give what Brazier his own shoe. Who who would you pick? Oh gosh, that's that's a hard one. So like a modern modern track athlete to get their own signature shoe. There's just so many. Cooper so here. Many. Cooper yeah, Tier. that would be that would know. be sweet. He's he's one of the most up and coming track athletes right now. And Hawker, yeah. Can you yeah, imagine? Yeah, crazy too. Can you imagine how great that would be? Nike breaks boundaries because apparently collegiate athletes will be able to get paid. So now, it's kind of tricky though because Tier's my age, but he's mm -hmm. going to get the year back now because of COVID. So if yeah. he stays, Nike makes a shoe with an NCA runner. Game over. <laughs> <laughs> that would be crazy. That would be awesome right? to see. Yeah, so what's it called? All right, now, OG Vic. So, yeah, we had the Kennedys, Elderess, Lenangs. Have you ever had a pair of Lenangs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's pretty – those are pretty interesting. It's pretty much that Zoom Miler bottom with just, like, a vented upper. Yeah. Oh, we forgot about the Ventilus. Yeah, yeah. Those are my favorite. The, yeah. the Ventilus Plus with the all-neon net on the top i like those yeah th those are sweet too and then you had the uh or the uh the elder it twos which uh was a little bit later like mid 2000s like with the zoom milers and then you had oh the, yeah yeah then you had the vent twos that was kind of like a short period and then kind of yeah, went the polka into polka dots <laughs> yeah 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 those were pretty those were pretty funky at the time yeah uh, and then you're kind of going into your zoom vic and then matumba ones and you know, one thing that I wish I had the money for back in like 2015, 2016, were all of the, I, you definitely remember, there was someone selling a lot of Nikes from like early 90s to late 2000s. Mm -hmm. And it was samples. I know you had a few of them, like crazy <laughs> polka dot ventilus and stuff. I just wish I had money for more of those. Um, yeah. It's, there's some cool ones. Yeah, there's so many crazy ones, like all these crazy samples from back in the day that you know, most of them were made by one of my friends. His name's Johnny uh, Truix. He he worked at Nike as a designer, so he worked with a lot of the track athletes at the time, from like mid mid nineties to all the way up until like you know uh, twenty eighteen, twenty twenty ish area. Wow! And his, his nickname was the Wild Horse. He made the Wild Horse. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's um. They don't make them anymore, but it's the Wild Horse and the Terra Kiger, right? Those are the two. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it's pretty interesting that now they take the peg and put, like, the Terra Kiger on it, like, for, like, trail stuff. I think they're cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, like, something you thought they would have done a long time ago, but. Yeah. <laughs> and um, maybe you could give us some show and tell us some cool stuff, because I know you got a lot that people want to see. Oh, man uh we'll start with those have, shoes behind you yeah yeah i don't have most of my stuff's in my closet i don't want to start digging through stuff and waste <laughs> yeah, too much yeah. time i just got got a few couple good things out um you know the og vic uh oregon ones one of my favorites those are great yeah what was good about those is nike doesn't advertise track spikes but they do it for a lot of universities and people don't even know yeah. about it yeah, especially the Victory Ones, there was, like, a lot of subtle, like, sponsorship or, like, cool collaborations with, you know, some of the schools, like, 
Oregon, Arkansas, you know, uh, I think Washington had a pair, you know, just yeah, I still, I still have the Washingtons. And the cool thing about those now is Washington's and Adidas school, I'm pretty sure. So no yeah, one's gonna be able to wear those. <laughs> Yeah, I tried to I tried to get all the old Washington Nike gear, but it didn't. It fell through. <laughs> you you get the coolest stuff. Like like show me one the the Afro duck that you're wearing right now. Oh yeah, I had to wear this for you because I know it's your favorite shirt. Yeah, the OG. which I'll, which I will be getting one day. <laughs> yeah, if I was to sell it, it's yours, man. And so now this is actually going back to the moon shoe sale. Mm -hmm. What happened? At first, you were trying to bundle everything, right? The whole, yeah. like, what someone would have worn if they were on the team at the time? Yeah, so first when I was kind of, like, window shopping at which auction I wanted to use, uh, at first, you know, Sotheby's was, you know, a first option, and then I thought their percentage was about 25%, and I thought that was a little too high. So I went with an auction called Golden Auctions. They only had the 10% fee, which I thought was nice, but... It, it was a terrible experience that I had. Uh, so pretty much there was a lack of communication with, you know, my stuff. And when I sent it there, you know, with the listing and all that stuff. And then their website crashed like multiple times during the sale of my items and other, and other people's items. What? And yeah, it was, it was really annoying. And it didn't get the, the publishing that I wanted it to. And uh, so it, it had gotten bid up to a certain amount. And I was like, I just want my items back. It was, you know, a terrible experience. And, you know, I didn't want to speak with them again. Yeah, I'm sorry that that happened. I remember going through it. You were also yeah. scared at one point that they were going to get lost, right? Because there was like a downtime. You didn't yeah. get them. Like, it was, it was odd. Yeah, so like, you know, after the auction had ended, you know, they had sent me this email like saying, congratulations. If you selected us with your auction and uh we're happy to sell your stuff and i was like dude my stuff didn't sell i just want my stuff back and you said it was an automated email i was like dude just send my stuff back yeah it was, it was just so annoying it took like a month to get my stuff back it's just major downtime and so i can only imagine how scary it is to ship those shoes the first nikes how did you get them to hong kong okay so uh yeah, yeah. Even shipping in the United States, I was scared because, you know, packages get lost all the time. Yeah. I was like, even if I put the value of what I paid for them, like, what's the value of what they're, you know, going to sell for? Like, is that covered for it? But yeah, pretty, exactly. much, pretty much after the golden auctions, like, scenario, uh, you know, I got with uh, Southern, Jordan Geller had got me with Sotheby's. He had brought me uh, to his auctioneer that had helped sell his moon shoes and his other shoes um started that and then over the next couple of months you know i signed my my contract with them and you know sent my stuff over to sotheby's and you know they sat for about six months um nobody was really interested then you know i got that whole hong kong uh thing that i could accept or not accept and you know it seemed like the right choice you know and it ended up paying for itself you know i was the best choice yeah, definitely. So what I didn't know is you sent it to Sotheby's in the United States and then mm -hmm. they did it internally. So nothing had a chance of being lost. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I sent it to their New York city location and then they shipped it. You know, I think it was like one day shipping over to Hong Kong or something super fast. Yeah. They probably had someone literally carrying them in like <laughs> 10 briefcases, just walking with it like this on a plane door to door. Dude, and that's... don't worry if they would have gotten lost in new york i would have been there first thing in the morning <laughs> and knocked on their door saying where are they where, where's jack and shoes at that's funny you should mention that because uh when i had went to portland in 2019 i had brought my moon shoes with me and i was i had flipped my backpack around and was hugging it while i was taking a nap on the, the seat oh my god <laughs> that thing would have been so scary sort of yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um all right so now What's there left to talk about? I think it's definitely worth noting just track spikes in general because a lot of people right now are really hyping up the the new Dragonfly and Vic. But what they don't realize are a few things. One, these shoes have been around and me and you have known about them because we collect spikes since what? Yeah. 20, early 2017? Because yeah, you had yeah. multiple pairs. You had multiple pairs of the, pro, of the prototypes 
and I had one pair that had uh, the tape. So people don't realize these spikes have been around. We've known about them. And if people were running fast in 2017, where's all the, where's all the confusion about the spikes? Yeah, I just feel like, I just feel like people are getting butt hurt. You know, there's always going to be innovation. Somebody's always going to have something that somebody else didn't think of. They're like, oh man, you know, yeah. what am I going to do? You know, like all these other brands, if they can't get that contract to get special foam or whatever, then they just kind of get like, oh man, we're just going to have to, you know, cry to the athletics union or whatever. Yeah, because there's two things. One, all right, so if everyone's mad about the spikes, let's all wear the moon shoes. And who's gonna, <laughs> no one's going to like that, so we can't do that. And, yeah. then, and then it becomes, okay, are we not going to run on tracks anymore? So I don't know. The spikes <laughs> are just crazy. I'm always for innovation. Just like you, we know how these spikes are made, the sampling and prototyping. And it's just, it's amazing innovation what goes through when you even see like there's so many pairs that we haven't shown people other than yeah. my spike collection that um are prototypes and you see Nike literally tries everything. It's crazy. Uh, uh hold that thought. I'm gonna grab one of those uh prototype dragons. Yes, or, yes, 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 do it. Yeah. To. Yeah, guys. So while Jackson's getting them, if you guys do not know, I have a spike video that shows a bunch of prototypes, but it's nothing in comparison to Jackson's collection of insane insane nike samples and here's one of them that i think he just recently got right yeah yeah i, I think i sent you a few teasers so oh, here man. yeah make sure wait make sure um if there's any numbers on it that they're not showing because I yeah know that the number like indicates a person yeah so, yeah, yeah. They're, they're all covered so we're good um, okay good perfect so pretty much i don't know if you can tell but it's all been wrapped in like an athletic tape so it's hiding this. They did this because they're like, oh, man, we don't want people knowing about our technology. So it has the air bubble. I, I haven't taken off the tape, nor do I want to. But it's just it's just pretty cool. And then you got that boat tail. Yeah, it's so cool. And then this this one's even more crazy. I haven't seen a prototype like it with that spike plate. It's just crazy. Yeah, yeah that's just amazing. Nike's innovation. Ten out of ten. Always. I'm always a fan for, I want to see it. And if I could, I will always bid on it, but I'll probably lose to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some, some things I just need to have. And I'm like, Oh man, did I just spend that much money? <laughs> uh, it is what it is. The only thing that I don't like with collecting spikes is that you obviously can't wear them unless you yeah. run. And I'm injured for, for life in terms of running. So yeah, I don't know. That, if, definitely, um, that definitely sucks. That's like, uh a friend of mine had mentioned like collecting track and field kits too it's like you can spend so much money but am i really going to run in this <laughs> exactly and even if you do run sometimes you don't want to run in them because they're worth so much yeah it's crazy sometimes especially yeah. those asian buyers yeah that's what i was gonna i was gonna bring up before we we go is that i really hope running starts to take off because we're seeing a lot of fast times. There's a lot of controversy, which is good for the sport in terms of innovation. Mm -hmm. And then also, when you want to sell something, there are buyers all <laughs> over the world that jump on it. Like that, that singlet that I gave you sold in, in what, 10 minutes or something to someone all yeah. the way in, I don't even remember where. <laughs> which, which singlet was that? I forgot. Remember, it was, the, it was the one that was a gold medalist without it being a gold medalist. Oh, yeah, yeah. I sent... There's a, there's a guy in Japan that I'm really tight with and he's, you know, he's always asking me, do you got any, you know, singlets or whatever? And I'm like, sent you, you sent me the pictures over and I showed him, he's like, I have to have it. You know, he paid yeah. us. Yeah. And we had it sent out the next day. Yeah. That's, what, <laughs> that's what's great. Hopefully uh, we could get something like, like track talk back because I think you started historic running at the end of track talk, right? Like, yeah. Like, I don't think you were able to really get in that community. Yeah, I, I didn't really, you know, I had, I had made an account and it took like three months to get approved because nobody was like on there, like admin yeah. wise. But yeah, you know, I was going through all the old posts. It was like, oh, this place is pretty cool. And, Cause you had mentioned it and a few other people had mentioned it and it was pretty much dead when I started my era of collecting and such. Yeah, it's unfortunate because what happened is, and actually when I met Kyle Merber at running camp mm -hmm. in, um, in like 2012, I was talking to him about spikes because apparently he was huge into spikes. And first it was 
it was Dystat. I don't know if you know, but Dystat that yeah. does results, they had a message board. Then it, <laughs> it like fell through and then they made track talk and then track talk fell through and we were able to revive it. Me and, uh, and GT <laughs> and a few oh, others yeah. like, like Nolan, shout out to Nolan. Um, yeah. like where he was to revive it. And, <laughs> and unfortunately now it's, it's dead. <laughs> yeah. It'd be cool if we can some, or create something similar, you know, yeah. kind of expand from what it was. Yeah. Because in terms of running, I mean, let's run is great, but mm -hmm. at the same time, there's something that let's run is so big that maybe they need something or maybe they just have like a brother or sister website that is like a community for just members to chat because there's so much on it that sometimes you get lost. <laughs> yeah. Like sometimes I'll go on there and it'd just be like a random chat board of like, Oh, I cheated on my wife. What do I do? And I was like, what, is, why is this on let's run? <laughs> exactly. Like, I just wanted to be <laughs> running. Yeah. <laughs> just some yeah. Stuff. Yeah. All right. So I think that's pretty good. Right. We, we spoke about everything. All yeah. of the spikes, the moon shoes, everything, right? Yeah, I feel like if we tried to get into everything like detailed wise, you'd have like a twelve hour video. So I think <laughs> we I think we did pretty good with the amount of time. Right. Hopefully when people watch it or even if no one watches it, hopefully it's not <laughs> all over the place too much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just kinda hard to squeeze everything in, you know. There's just so much information. Yeah, you know, definitely. Maybe, maybe in the future we can kind of like break down different, you know, segments and do more videos. Yeah. Especially, you know, maybe hopefully a lot of people watch till the end or maybe not, <laughs> but maybe let's put a question out now. Um, if people would want to be interested in like some sort of video podcast, because I feel like we have the ability to speak about a lot and we know a good amount of people. Hopefully we get our, our friend overseas on this um yeah that would be great yeah that yeah definitely hopefully people watch to the end and you know put in the comments yeah. or something you know you want to see more yeah. videos go in more yeah. depth etc maybe when um maybe when we um like advertise it we'll say if you don't finish it at least go to the end and answer the question <laughs> <laughs> right 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 yeah all right so that's good great to finally meet you face to face yeah. although it's over zoom but soon yeah. soon we'll uh we'll meet up yeah definitely hopefully we can meet in new york or something you know have have yeah. some fun yeah definitely <laughs> all right i'll talk to you later all right peace man peace peace have a good one you too oh boy how do i end to exit okay there we go i just realized i gotta stop recording before i end it uh it's okay